Welcome. This is our third presentation of Windows on Our History, which is sort of a preview of what's going to be our book about the history of the Sisters of St. Joseph in the United States that will probably be called Anything of Which a Woman is Capable because that's just about what we are all about and doing. So, the last time we went up to 1860. Now, where are we by 1860? We're already established in St. Louis, Philadelphia, Toronto, St. Paul, Wheeling, uh, in 1860 it's Wheeling, Virginia, Canandaigua, New York, which becomes Buffalo and then Rochester, not just Mississippi, which we'll hear more about as we go on today, uh, which came from France. Uh, Sulphur Springs, Mississippi, Brooklyn, Albany, and we'll get eerie just after some of what's going on at the beginning of what we do today. How did we get there? What all, what do we have? Who founded these things? Well, Le Puy, to Lyon, we think is probably a pretty straight line. Lyon to Crandolet, we know that that's a pretty straight line. Then, Crandolet founded Philadelphia. That's a good straight line. From there on, the two start crossing as Crandolet founds St. Paul, but Mother St. John Fournier comes up from Philadelphia to be part of that. Uh, Toronto is founded by Sister Delphine Fontbon under the authority of, I don't know, <laughs> Mother Celestine at Crandolet, <clears throat> Mother St. John Fournier at Philadelphia. Uh, Wheeling comes out of Philadelphia, but with sisters from Crandolet. This is all a mixture as we're getting started. Um, I think the one thing we can say pretty well for sure is nobody was acting alone. So then, events that changed the context of what was happening with us. The first was probably the death of Bishop Joseph Creighton in St. Paul in 1857. We had been up there in St. Paul since 1851 and the sisters were established well in the diocese. Bishop Creighton had known us since before he became bishop. He had stayed at Crandolet for a while when the Mississippi was frozen, and he and his friend Bishop Loris couldn't get up to uh, Dubuque. But he died in 1857. So did Mother St. John, I mean, Mother Celestine Pomerel. So the question was, who can step in? Celestine has been the superior at Crandolet during all the time, really, that Mother St. John Fournier was superior at Philadelphia. So Bishop Kenrick calls the sisters and says, we will have an election. They elect Sister Seraphine Conklin from St. Paul. This is why Bishop Creighton's death has an influence on this. She said, the Vicar General here says, that there's too much confusion in St. Paul now that Bishop Creighton has died and we don't have a replacement. I think I can't leave. Besides, I don't feel real well. So, Bishop Kenrick appoints Mother St. John Fosmas. There are some sources that say that Mother Celestine had suggested that Fosmas would be the best replacement. There's another source that says the sisters were all upset and screaming and crying and putting on a great act. We don't know. But Mother St. John Fosmas became the next superior at Crandolet. Now, Mother Celestine had started movement toward having a congregation, an independent and probably papally approved congregation in the United States. What we saw in that second slide was that she and Mother St. John Fournier were acting like two major superiors in the United States, sending sisters out to found in other places. Mother Celestine died before things could be accomplished, and she had she was having some illness.
for the year or so before she died. She had visited all of the houses, but was not real well. The bishop, the first bishop in Philadelphia that we dealt with was Bishop Francis Patrick Kenrick. He was the brother of Peter Richard Kenrick, which is really why the first mission outside of St. Louis went that way. Bishop Kenrick was made Bishop Archbishop of Baltimore. In his place was Bishop John Newman, who we know as St. John Newman. He and Mother St. John Fournier were great friends. And there have been plans in the works to have a meeting and bring the superiors together about how shall we organize ourselves? What structures do we need? Well, in January of 1860, Bishop John Newman dies. He was a religious, and he knew the sisters. In his place comes Bishop Wood, who was one of these interesting characters. We had a number of them during those years. Men made bishops who were converts to the faith. So they didn't, Bishop Wood didn't go up, grow up knowing sisters, and he didn't have a sense of religious community. So, they call a meeting for 1860 at Crondelet uh, to discuss congregational structures. All the superiors are invited. Not all of them attend. The ones invited include St. Paul, St. Louis, Natchez, Mississippi, Philadelphia, Buffalo, Toronto, and Hamilton. Uh, they don't, these sisters don't attend. Buffalo, Brooklyn, uh, Philadelphia, Toronto. Why? The bishops, the bishop said no is the best that we can come up with. Uh, the sisters in Natchez, about whom we will hear, were not invited because they belonged to what was really an international congregation, such as the St. Joseph of Bourg. Now at this 1860 meeting, they put together a proposed constitution. And it was based on a constitution that Lyon had just come up with. Lyon, since the time of Mother St. John Fontbonne in 1814 or so, had been pulling together different groups of sisters of St. Joseph under one congregational structure unifying the novitiates so that there was a unity of identity, a unity of formation, and so on. For all of those years, they continued with a constitution that had been, its last rewriting had been in the 1730s. And they hadn't adjusted to this new structure with a superior general and multiple houses underneath them. So the constitution that's being proposed in 1860 is based on Lyon's new constitution. And it adds congregational governments with provinces under a general aid. Now this province idea makes sense in the context of the United States because of the distances that we are. And because so many of these groups that had started somewhere were in more than one diocese. So, this is their proposal in 1860. Crondelet has a, an introduction to this that explains that the changes are modifications just designed to increase the mutual support and dependence of the various houses among themselves and to give greater stability and uniformity to the whole congregation. Now that is copied almost word for word from Lyon's constitutions. What's the real difference between these constitutions? First of all, the idea of provinces, where you would have another level of organization. So provinces are there instead of Mother Celestine and the St. John's, I say, Fournier and Phasmas, leading, running the story. The other really big difference is the role of the bishops. The 1836 constitutions, which came from that 17, 
something constitution in France, said the bishops are regarded as the superiors of, the major superiors of the sisters. They are to be given profound respect, submission, and obedience. And they are to be considered as holding the place of Jesus Christ in the life of the sisters. The 1860 Constitution of the Sisters of St. Joseph of Crandolet approved, pretty much probably edited, by Bishop Kenrick says, sisters are subject to the, th the authority of the bishop as to their ordinary. They shall render him the obedience due the authority with which he is invested. Now that is one major difference. For what all the bishop can do in the life of the, the congregation, the life of the sisters. So, what happens when we get these sisters together? It's interesting when we see who these bishops are. Bishop Grace of St. Paul, Bishop McCloskey of Albany, Bishop Elder of Natchez, Mississippi, Bishop Dugan of Chicago, Peter Richard Kenrick of St. Louis, and Bishop Junker of Alton. They all were open to this idea of a congregation with provinces, that the sisters who were working in their diocese could be a part of this with a mother house and no bishop, for the most part somewhere that other than in their own diocese. These bishops did not like that idea. Bishop Tymon of Buffalo, Bishop Laughlin of Brooklyn, Bishop Wheeling, Bishop Whalen of Wheeling, <laughs> and Bishop Wood of Philadelphia. They're all Irish. There's a lot of Irish there, yes. But there's also what almost looks like a, an east-west split. The only Easterner on the yes side to congregation is McCluskey of Albany. And one small factor involved in that might have been the fact that he had at that time a few Sisters of St. Joseph from St. Louis working in the diocese as of May 1860. In June of 1860, he had been promised the arrival of more. So there wouldn't have been any more if he had said no. The question becomes, to whose advantage is it to be a congregation or not? And who really made the decision? We don't have pure records that say absolutely who had the, the final say, the final sway in some of these things. One of the interesting stories is Wheeling, which I mentioned the last time we did this, that the Bishop of Wheeling said the sister superior could go to the meeting at Crandolet to announce that they wouldn't be part of it. <laughs> She was young. She was a vocation from Greenland. She caught a cold at Crandolet. She came home and was sick. She wasn't well enough to stay at the, at the mother house or their convent. They sent her to her family's home to get well, and she died. So the bishop was suddenly left, Whalen, with very few sisters. He said, those who want to be part of Crandolet may go back. The, those who wish to stay may stay. And he ended up with nobody with any experience. And so what he did, you know, he wasn't on good terms really with Crandallet at this point. So he turned to uh, Brooklyn and said to Bishop Lachlan, give me some help. And they sent uh, a sister to a sister um, DeChantel Keating, who was superior there for a number of years through the Civil War and did great things for them. But the question would be, for me, whose advantage was it and who really decided? So in the end, the decision was that Crandallet, there would be, would be a congregation with two provinces at that time, St. Louis and St. Paul. Albany became a province in 1862. Remember in 1860, there were hardly any sisters there in the Albany Diocese. Philadelphia remained, Philadelphia was the other big, pretty solidly established community at that time. They remained independent and became a papal congregation 
with the approval of their constitutions in 1896, this whole question of approving the constitutions is another story of intrigue, among other things, among these bishops. There were those in Rome pushing to help Crandolets get approved, and some pushing against it. And you know, it's all back and forth. But then Wheeling, Buffalo, Toronto, Hamilton all begin as diocesan congregations. Now one of the interesting things for me is what happens with Erie. This meeting that I just talked about at Crandolette was on May 2nd, 1860. On May 24th, 1860, Mother Agnes Spencer, Sister Augustine Spencer, her sister, Sister St. Protes de Bois, who was one of the original French missionaries, and Sister Césarine Malvé, who is a character, went to establish the community in the Diocese of Erie. Now, who are these people? Uh, Mother, Mother Agnes and her sister, Saint August, Sister Augustine, came from what was probably a pretty well-to-do family. They were born in England and um, emigrated to the United States and were in New York before the family moved to St. Louis. Mike, it sounds like perhaps they were merchants, you know, maybe he had a store, a decent store. Um, so the two girls went to St. Joseph's Academy and converted to the Catholic faith and then decided to enter the, the congregation. They entered, I believe it was two years apart, uh, although Agnes was four years older than her sister. Uh, sister St. Protes, we've heard about, she's one of our main chroniclers of our early history. And Sister Césarine Mauve was Irish born, received in 1849 at Carondelet, made vows in 51, which meant that she was in the novitiate class between the two Spencer sisters. You know, when you see how these people were all together, it's really a, a hothouse of what was going on. From 1852 to 55, Césarine is in St. Paul. And there she has some troubles with the bishop. She, she's one of those who kind of gets caught up with this crazy priest who wanted to help the sisters start a much better congregation. Uh, they, they were the sisters of the most pure love of God or something like that. I, I can't remember the name exactly. But she refused to come back. Bishop Creighton excommunicated her. Then they made peace. She came back. And she ends up in 1860 going to Erie. Uh, the, her records say she left the congregation. We aren't sure too much of the rest of her story. They start in this little town of Corsica. Now this was, this was a little out of the way, off beaten track, small town. Why four sisters were called to start a Catholic school here is hard to understand. But they put the ad in the paper, St. Anne's Academy for Young Ladies, Corsica, Jefferson County, Pennsylvania, under the charge of the Sisters of St. Joseph. This institution, instead of saying it's out in the middle of nowhere, it's situated in one of the most delightful and healthful areas of western Pennsylvania. <laughs> Being on the turnpike, well, close to on the turnpike, major, <laughs> between those major cities of Brookville and Clarion, it's of easy access by stage. The system of education embraces every useful and ornamental branch suitable for young ladies. And so it goes on. Uh, the terms, tuition, board, washing, bed, and bedding for, by, for the year, $80. Uh, music, an extra 10. French, an extra 10. And for particulars, see the superiors of the academy, Sister Agnes Spencer. Here's a little map giving us somewhat of an idea. Here's Here's Clarion. Um, Corsica doesn't quite make the map. <laughs> but Clarion, and we will later hear about Meadville and Erie, and we see over there in the corner, we've got Cleveland. So for those of us who aren't familiar with that part of the country, uh, it gives us a little bit of an idea. Now the, the story of the sisters in Erie says, finding the people too poor 
to sustain a boarding school, Mother Agnes closed it and went to Frenchtown in Clarion County, another place that doesn't quite make the map. The conditions there were not much better, and there were no provisions for regular reception of the sacraments. In 1864, the little band moved to Meadville. It was here that she purchased the site upon which stood St. Joseph's Hospital. Now here's one of the stories that gives us an idea of the character of our friend Mother Agnes Spencer. She wanted the hospital. She needed to get a loan to buy the land and start the building. She went to get a loan, and she was told no. Basically, the idea, it was sort of, uh, what do they call it, NEMA, no Irish need apply, no Catholics need look for money. She went back home, changed her clothes, went in as Miss Mary Spencer, and got all the loans she needed. <laughs> so she used that loan, plus some of her own family money, to get things going. Uh, Pretty foxy, you're right. Um, another case on that anti-Catholicism that gives us an interesting idea of what they were doing. Uh, the, there was a convent of Brigidine sisters, and we can probably guess were Irish. Uh, and their convent was burned. Their convent caught fire. Now, there was some rumor that this could have been a fire set. It wasn't unusual, it wasn't impossible for convents to be burned in those days. Um, so the Brigidine sisters were burned out of their home in Titusville. They and the orphans had no place to stay. Uh, it's said at the suggestion of Bishop Mullen, the two, Brigid two of the Brigidines entered the Benedictine convent in Erie. The sisters of St. Joseph, according to their rule, not being able to receive them into the community. The other professed sisters went to Rochester and Troy, New York. So that means they went to other congregations of St. Joseph. But they couldn't, the eerie rule wasn't open for them to, to go into it. So, uh, there we have the population of Corsica was 250, thank you. Meadville, 3,700. And when she goes to Erie, it's a major city. 9,000, almost 500. Uh, in 1863, they received their first postulate and also had the first death. They moved to Meadville in 1864. The orphanage becomes a hospital. Uh, Quickly, how that happened was, they had an orphanage. There was a train wreck in town. They didn't know where to take the injured. So they took them to the orphanage, and the orphanage became the first hospital. <laughs> a sister of St. Joseph does anything of which a woman is capable to serve the dear neighbor. By 1865, they're announcing a new place. And Mother Agnes goes to Erie to start again. She's very much on the move. Uh, you know, kind of no grass grows under your feet. It's gotten to start, you know, sounds like a maxim. Get things off to a good start and move on. She goes to Erie with two orphans to start an orphanage and a hospital. It's not an easy time. There are poor people all over. The, the growing population are the immigrants. Uh, people who had come to build the railroads, you know, we're not, we're not talking the old establishment. <coughs> so the annals for the sisters say, uh, talk about their, their getting money. March 17, 1866, a suffer was given at Farrar Hall for the benefit of the orphans. September 10, 1866, Sister Martha received a donation of $193.25 from the employees of the Pittsburgh docks. Mm -hmm. They were down there begging on the docks. Uh, an orphan's fair in Erie brought in $1,850. The state appropriated $2,000 to the orphan asylum. Uh, Bishop Mullen told the people of the area to give uh, at the Easter collection for the sisters and the orphans. 
Then there's a card of thanks published in the local newspaper. And this gives us a real sense of it. So they, you know, sort of like the want ads. We return our sincere thanks to John Casey Esquire for a donation of $50 on the morning of the 8th. This is not the first time this benevolent gentleman has sent liberal offerings to the little orphans. Also to Mr. Bernard Donner for $5. Mr. Smith for seven boys' winter caps. Mrs. Matthews for 29 pounds of pork. Mrs. Valentine Schultz for two gallon crocks of butter. May God bless the cheerful giver. So if they're at the point of publishing thanks for a $5 gift and woolen caps, we've got a sense of how they were doing. At another point, Mother Agnes made a, a month-long uh, fundraising trip for which she came back and wrote a thanks for the $130 that she gained on it. So here's our mother, Agnes Spencer. Uh, just a little recap of her life. Born August 15, 1823. Died March 22, 1882. Did not live a long life. Received the, ha received the habit in 1846. Vows, 1848. Was superior of St. John's Orphanage in Philadelphia. Founders of Wheeling. Founders of Canandaigua Buffalo. And founders of Erie. And she was in Erie for 22 years before she died. Mother Agnes, uh, we might, in a less formal way, say she took in strays. Martha Bunning. Sister Martha Bunning was, or is she sometimes called Von Bunning. Born in Germany, entered the congregation at Crandallet. She worked with Mother Delphine Fogbein in St. Louis and then accompanied her to Philadelphia when they opened the, when Delphine took over at the orphanage and probably as Natalie's director. She went with Delphine to Canada. You know, now this is one of those, from where did they go from Philadelphia from Crondelet? They were sisters of St. Joseph and they opened a mission. Um, within about a year or two, in Canada, they opened a second mission in Hamilton. It became a separate congregation. By 1862, so say about 10 years, Martha had received 23 novices. Uh, so things were going well in Canada. But somehow she didn't seem to get on particularly well with the bishop. Uh, they had a school, and it turns one day Martha calls the faculty together and they're having a faculty meeting. All the sisters, the girls, are supposed to be behaving themselves. Well, they start playing in the sacristy and touching the sacred vessels. This is, this is all it takes for the bishop to depose and exile Martha Bunny. She has, she's just kicked out and he appoints a new superior. So what does she do? Well, go to Erie. Mother Agnes is at Erie. So she goes to Erie, and this was just as some other sisters that we'll hear about later had left, had left Erie. And Mother Agnes needed the help. She worked with Mother Agnes for a few years. And then it says, in 1868, she had a dream in which she met Mother Delphi, who was deceased by then, who said to her, if you only knew the, act, the, the value of one act of humility, you'd go to the ends of the earth to perform it. Fearing that there'd be any lingering trace of bitterness in her heart, she returned to Hamilton to beg pardon of the bishop. Bishop Farrell refused to see her or even allow her into the house. The Hamilton sisters were forbidden to allow her into any of their houses. She made her way back to Toronto, where the sisters cared for her, and they say within a few weeks she died of a broken heart. Now, the next stray. Sister George Bradley, or Georgiana, or St. George. 
uh, born in 1824. Some records say in Pennsylvania, some records say in Ireland. Received the habit at Crondelet in 1848, so that was at 24 years of age. Uh, made vows in 1850, became provincial superior of St. Paul in 1865. So now you got to see, she was a sister of St. Joseph of Crandallet, working in St. Paul when all of this move toward congregation was beginning. By 1865, she is the provincial. 1867, the new Crandallet constitutions receive approval for their final 10-year trial, uh, living trial under, um, in practice. Mother George is not happy with the new constitutions. And so she writes a letter to the Cardinal Prefect of Religious in Rome. And she says, We, the undersigned religious of the Congregation of St. Joseph, living in the Diocese of St. Paul, do humbly come before you to request some change in our present state. We were governed by the old rule, framed, now this is this is direct quote, by Monsignor Henri de Mopes. However, the House of Crandelet adopted a totally new rule. It was adopted by a majority of two or three votes. <laughs> we actually found, find ourselves in a religious order essentially and totally different, subjected to rules that we never vowed to observe. Indeed, the whole community in this diocese, with the exception of two or three lately, hardly desire a return to the old state of things. Their names, however, not on this petition. We then humbly and earnestly ask of your eminence to be able to separate finally from Crandallet to resume the old rule. We ask for ourselves permission to present ourselves to one of the communities living under the old rule. And then she adds one little final touch to that. Please don't mention this letter to Crandallet. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know what kind of reply she might have gotten from Rome. But she was no longer superior, provincial superior, and was sent to Peoria, to what was admittedly a difficult situation. She walked into a school as a superior where there was a great deal of debt. Anybody with their head on straight figured the place was going to close. But she didn't <coughs> stick around to figure that out. She just left. And Probably not alone. And where did she go? Here. Here. Mother Here. Agnes Spencer to Erie. And Mother Agnes sends her to Meadville to take over the hospital. So, 1871, while all of this is going on, Mother Agnes Spencer opens a school in Meadville, Ohio, which is outside the Diocese of Erie. Now, we're not checking canonical statuses at this point. Are they down here? Are they just go to But they're in Ohio. Eight sent all of his sisters back in the home diocese. <coughs> Sister George Bradley is in the diocese. She's left without ostensible permission from anybody. There's a letter. Mother George, this is in the annals of Erie. Mother M. George Bradley, accompanied by Sister M. Aurelia Bracken, left the Erie Diocese to take charge of St. Mary's School in Painesville, Ohio, which our sisters had relinquished. This was the initial step in the foundation of the Sisters of St. Joseph of the Diocese of Cleveland. So she went from Peoria to Erie to Meadville, and then from Meadville to Painesville. Uh, and it, she's not called one of our sisters. Then the Bishop of Erie writes a formal permission for her and her sisters 
to be in the Diocese of Cleveland. Which is real interesting because they never got permission to go to the Diocese of Erie. But to whoever may read this letter, we make it known and testify that the obedience given to us of sisters George, Aurelia, and Magdalene, now residing in the town of Painesville, is transferred to the most reverend and illustrious Richard Gilmore, Bishop of Cleveland. So, we have our sisters on the move. Uh, in 1875, they go from Painesville to Cleveland. 1877, they purchased their first property for the community that by then is 12. In 1880, they purchased Starkweather, which had enough room for the 33 of them who were there in 1833. Uh, they also, by 1892, with deaths and a couple of leavings, they had 34 professed sisters, uh, seven novices, and six postulates. So making a really long story short, Mother George Bradley died July 2nd, 12th, 1901. And the newspaper says every sister in the community, which comprises about 85 members was present. The sisters sang the Mass of Requiem and afterwards marched in the procession to the little cemetery. The remains of their beloved mother are the first to sleep in the little graveyard, newly made on the convent grounds. May she rest in peace. So by 1870, here's where we are as Sisters of St. Joseph with our founding dates. St. Louis, Philadelphia, St. Paul in Toronto, Wheeling, Buffalo, Bourg, which we're about to go to. Uh, Brentwood, we saw in the last, was founded in 1856, Albany in 1858, Erie now 1860. St. Augustine, we haven't talked about, came from Le Puy in 1866. Rochester was founded out of Buffalo in 1868. Baden in 1869, and Tucson will come in 1870. But for the moment, we're going to find out just a little about our French sisters in the South. We're going back to France. Mother St. John Fontbonne uh, had established 27 local communities in the area that became the Diocese of Bedi. In 1823, the Sisters of St. Joseph of Bourg became established as an independent congregation of St. Joseph. So this is, this is like we've seen before. Chambéry did that, and Chambéry founded Moutier, and so on. Now, there's an interesting little way that things start to happen. There's a Father Bouteau who their history re refers to only as Father Bouteau. He doesn't have a name, it doesn't say where he's from. But a little investigation finds that he was from Paris. Father Bouteau is back in France. He's a missionary in Indiana. In fact, it's Father Bouteau who brought Mother Theodore Guerin and her community to the St. Mary of the Woods area, the Sisters of Providence. So here he is. Father Bouteau riding a streetcar in Paris. And he meets the Vicar General of Metz, which is a diocese up in the northeastern part of France. And this vicar looks at him and thinks he must be a Protestant minister because of the way he's dressed. He's in kind of a long coat and a tie. This is the way priests in the United States dressed in those days. So they strike up a conversation. And the Father Bouteau starts to tell him about the adventures of missionary life. And you can just, he ought to be Irish for the way he went on with this. You know, he told him about sleeping out under the stars and how he had to ride horseback and camp out and cross rivers. And he was given by the Holy Father a privilege that almost no priest in the whole world probably has. He's allowed to carry the consecrated host with him on these missionary journeys. But he carries it in a handkerchief. 
because they are so poor, he has no picks. Well, the vicar general, Shalandon, is so moved. He gives him money to buy a picks. He gives him money for the missions. And they've become friends. Uh, 1854, Father Bouteau returns to France, and now the vicar general is the Bishop of Belly. Mm -hmm. And Father Bouteau wants sisters to help. This is Father Bouteau. Bouteau, the missionary, asks the bishop for help. The bishop says, can't do it. We don't have any sisters. The missionary begs. The bishop sends him to Mother Claude of the Sisters of St. Joseph of Bourg. And the world grows smaller and more connected for the Sisters of St. Joseph. So, imagine they decided to send three sisters to, by now Father Bouteau is in uh, Mississippi, he's in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. So, Mother Eulalie, Sister Anatoly, and Sister Marie de Gonzaga. Now, Mother Eulalie, when she volunteers, says, I may be a little old for this, but my heart has been there forever, so let me go. She had been at least 25 years a sister of St. Joseph, so let's say she was probably in her 40s. Uh, Sister Anatoly, not a lack of information could I get about her, except that she was a dear friend of Mother Eulalie. And so, on November 11th, 1854, they had a farewell ceremony. And for the last time, it's, their book says, the entire family participated in the Eucharistic banquet. And after a fraternal embrace, the missionary sisters departed, bringing with them the bishop, blessing of their bishop and that of the whole community. Sister Marie de Gonzague was a nurse uh, and the other two were from the same local community. Now, apparently, this sister nurse was also a lay sister. Uh, their trip took 41 days, and just about the time they were taking off, they found out that Father Bouteau would not be traveling with them because he had to hurry back and he'd be taking a steamer ship. So they weren't happy with that. But they came to New Orleans. And I think probably half the religious in the United States must owe a debt of thanks to the Ursulines of New Orleans, who received so many of us. Father Bouteau, it says, had obtained hospitality for us from the Ursuline sisters. Their simple, gracious, sincere attentions put us at our ease and made us feel quite at home. Uh, the bishop deigned to visit us various several times during our stay with the Ursulines. He received us with a touching kindness as a father receives his children. In spite of our wish to make our home in his Episcopal city of Natchez, submitting to his wishes and those of Father Bouteau, we left immediately for Bay St. Louis, our new foundation, and Father accompanied us. And now we say, beginnings are not particularly easy. As uh, Mother Eulalie wrote home, there was yellow fever every year. From October to May, we have no meat. This country, she says, certainly inherited some of the plagues of Egypt. <laughs> Constantly we are harassed by flying insects. It's a little martyrdom. From June on, there are mosquitoes, then gnats. Please give me permission to wear white stockings. Uh, because the others are too hot. And the lay sisters, please let them wear capes. So this is Mother Yule. Their missions, by the, by the end of 1855, they had two schools. A boarding school, which was less than an overwhelming success. There just weren't enough children. Uh, there were too few boarders. Absolutely overworked sisters. 
life in the local community wasn't perfect. And the kids could not stand the food that the sisters were fixing. <laughs> there was French food for these Creole kids, and it just didn't fly. And then there were lots of other cultural differences. They were working with the poor in rural Mississippi or Louisiana. And they were probably very well cultured French women. It was more than she had expected to take on. So, uh, Father Bouteau writes back to the Superior General, the devil is very jealous, furious in fact. He does everything he can do to harm your work. I hope your sisters will not be discouraged. Please send us some more. <laughs> and so she does. Bourg sent three additional sisters in 1856. Mother Eulalia, who was having such a hard time in Bay St. Louis, opened a home for the aged in New Orleans. Requests for more sisters in 57. Additional sisters came before the Civil War, but then communications got cut off from France during the whole time of the war. But France continued to uh, supply sisters. 1863, the bishop of New Orleans now. So these sisters are not tied to one diocese, not just New Orleans, but see they're part of a congregation from Bourg. He arranges to have permission for France to found a novitiate in America. So they start a novitiate and Mother Eulalie is appointed superior of the novitiate with the title provincial. Interesting. Um, the first religious profession happened for this community in the United States in 1866. So it was a little while before they received a native vocation. And that was Sister Philomene and Sister Marie Joseph received the habit and then they had um, postulants. Sisters Teresa Estelle arrived from France. Sister Esther, who arrived in 66, died in 67 of yellow fever. As you go through the annals of this community, time after time they're mentioning we had a death in September, we had a death in October, and the ages were typically 19, 22, 23. When Mother Eulalie died, she was one of the oldest to die in her, well she was nearly 60, but there was another one who died in her 40s. She died in 1865. 1876 was the first official visitation of a superior from France to the United States. That's a hunk of time to not have anybody in authority come over and see you. Now, these are the Maidai sisters. Started out with the tradition of ministry to prisoners. Um, they say, the sister who went says, the prisoners are hurled, huddled together like cattle in dark, dirty and dingy cells. Fresh air and sunshine is unknown, as is also the elevating influence of religion. Cruel and brutal treatment, insufficiency of wholesome food. The sisters not only offered spiritual assistance, but also bettered the material conditions. Pardon for minor offenses, and they found ways to shorten terms for major crimes. Uh, These sisters, how did they get to Cincinnati? Cincinnati was an industrial place. And a group of women, younger, when they started they were younger women, opened a boarding house for working women, the Sacred Heart Home, uh, by a woman with two companions. Then it happens. It happens that the superior, Mother Albina, is traveling from New Orleans to France and goes through Cincinnati, which means that they weren't any longer taking the route out from New Orleans. And come, actually, she was coming back from France. And seeking hospitality, she ended up staying at this boarding house. It sounds like maybe there was a little more underneath the table on this. The bishop 
uh, in Cincinnati at this point is named Elder. He had been the previous bishop of Natchez. So he knows these sisters, and she just happens to stop in Cincinnati and meet these people who have this boarding house. And they arrange to accept the boarding house, and the nine women on the staff decide that they'll become postulants. Everybody except the one who founded it joined the community. Uh, but the one who, who decided they'd enter this community, who now have their mother house in New Orleans, stayed in Cincinnati for their postulate and novitiate so that they wouldn't interrupt the work of the boarding house. Uh, so they are received into the community and they make vows when the assistant superior general comes. By 1915, they have bought what became their Cincinnati mother house, but it wasn't made a provincial house until 1862. I'm going to kind of hurry through them, just because we're going to go to Argyle, Crookston, Minnesota. It's just 2,300 miles off the river <laughs> from New Orleans. Interestingly, it's only 4,400 miles from Crookston to Paris. So, <laughs> um, there's a father, Barat, who asks for French sisters to help in Argyle and then Crookston, where there are a lot of French Canadian immigrants. So that's how those sisters get up there. Uh, they're in Crookston, Minneapolis, Somerset, Wisconsin, North Dakota, Canada. And I think maybe we'll stop here and not get ourselves into Evansburg, which will become the big congregation. That will be for the next round of Windows on Our History. But thank you very much for being here, for paying attention, for watching it online, for those of you who are out there. And we'll have another one of these in a month or so.